Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Greetings to you, my friend. It is the Friday edition here at Bible Tract Echoes. You made it through another week. Congratulations. I hope it's been a profitable week for your personal life and your work and your family, but also and especially so in your walk with the Lord. And I hope that as we go and look at the Word of God today, that we use our time even to help us prepare our hearts and lives for being in God's house this coming Lord. Day. Now, if you can right now, get your Bible out and join me as my Bible sits open to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. 2 Peter 1, why don't you get something on which you can take some notes? I've got a gospel tract in my hand. Have you ever given a lost person a gospel tract? If you haven't, then I want to give you some gospel tracts whereby you can extend the gospel message of salvation, of everlasting life to people who, in many respects, respects have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many people in religious countries, including your own, have heard about religion. They've heard about Jesus, but they've never heard a simple, clear presentation of the gospel. I want to encourage you to do that using gospel tracts. Now, yesterday in the broadcast, I ended with an old saying that goes like this. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, I've never been around horses a whole lot. I do understand the old saying. I used it yesterday in light of the passage here in verses 12 to 15 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter, the apostle, he's an old man when he pens this book, Jesus has told him that he is soon going to die. So he wants to do something before his death, and he wants to repeat and repeat and repeat some idea so that at the end of his life, he's going to be remembered for this. The idea that Peter wants to be remembered for is that God's people were saved to grow into Christ likeness. Yesterday, we saw that in our verses here that even mature believers can become drowsy and sleepy in their walk with Christ. They can become complacent about spiritual growth. So Peter plans to persistently try to wake up drowsy disciples. But here's another danger. The danger is not only that in the first century believers that one that they faced, we face it today. Before Peter gets done with this book, he's going to spend a full third of this little letter called 2 Peter to deal with this other danger. If Peter gave so much emphasis to the danger then, then perhaps we had better identify it and take heed to his warning today. And that's our goal. Get your Bible. Join me. 2 Peter chapter 1. I mentioned gospel tracts a moment ago. That word tracts is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. A gospel tract is a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. The one in my hand right now is entitled, Will You Live Forever? Will you live forever? And the answer is yes. Whether you're saved or lost, people, everybody's going to live forever. The issue is where? Will it be in heaven in a place of glory and bliss and in the presence of Christ, a place of great joy, or will it be in the lake of fire, a place of torment and punishment for all eternity? That's not a hard decision to make, is it, friend? But people who want to go to heaven often do not want to receive Christ. That's the problem. But so many people don't know that they need Christ and we need to tell them the gospel. This gospel track, Will You Live Forever, is a powerful little tool that lays out the fact that the dead shall rise. All the dead are going to rise and going to face the Lord Jesus Christ as a judge. 
and is going to talk about in this track that if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, then there's no hope for us, but he has risen, and he will be the judge of all men. And there's a way out of that judgment, and that's by receiving Christ as Savior from sin. Here's a great, great tool. People need this tool. Why don't you let me send it to you? At the end of the broadcast, my announcer will give our contact information. Have pen and paper handy. Jot down the contact method that works for you. Give us your name and address. We'll send you a free sample packet of our tracks. Or you can go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org. Do that today. Do that today. And do that today. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says this. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, it's right, as long as I am in this tabernacle, my body here, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, my body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Three times in our verses here, we have the word remember or remembrance used. And what Peter wanted the believers to remember in that day is that they were called to what verse 3 says, glory and virtue. They were called. If you're a believer, you and I were called to glory and virtue. Now, the word glory does not refer to the glory like we give to a war hero or a great athlete. The glory here refers to the glory of a godly life. Some Bible translations will actually put this verse, the end of verse 3, this way. God has called us to a godly and virtuous life. Well, that kind of life is not one that is dominated by sin habits. So here in our verses, Peter is telling his readers and he's telling us that he is, will energetically work to remind the God's people to live lives of holiness and practical sanctification. Peter was doing this, verse 13 says, because even many mature believers were spiritually sleeping. They needed to be stirred up. They needed to be awakened, made alert to the truth that even they, mature saints, need to keep on growing in Christ's likeness. But then, but then, when Peter gets into chapter 2 of his letter, he talks about what chapter 2, verse 1, calls false prophets or false preachers. When we get to chapter 2 in our study, we're going to deal with all that's said here in greater detail, but I want to give you a sneak peek into chapter 2 today. Why does Peter challenge believers to live lives of godliness and virtue? And then spend a whole third of his time in this book dealing with bad religious teachers. Why does he do that? Well, if your Bible is open, turn to chapter 2 and walk through at least some key thoughts here in chapter 2 with me for a moment. The bad religious leaders are, verse 1 says, bringing in damnable heresies. A heresy is simply a teaching that is contrary to the truth. Verse 1 says that some bad teachers deny even truth about Jesus who died on the cross to purchase sinners from hell. But go down into chapter 2 with me for a moment. Look at verse 10. Part of verse 10 says this, speaking about these bad teachers, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. I'm going to say that again. Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. They are walking, they're conducting their daily life in a predetermined direction. They're headed in a moral direction. And that direction is to please their fleshly desires. I heard an old preacher a long time ago put it this way. It stuck in my peanut butter brain. He said this, and I'm quoting now. These people had a hankering for moral pollution. I like that. These people had a hankering for moral pollution. Now, friend, that may seem like country talk to you, but it sure correctly nails the truth of verse 10. 
if religious leaders practice living lives of their own, their own lives pleasing their flesh, then that's what they're going to be teaching those attending their church services. But we're not done yet. Look, go to verse 14. Part of verse 14 says this, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. These bad religious teachers are morally perverse and consistently so, plus they are clueless on how to conquer sin habits in their life, and they can't tell anybody else how to conquer sin habits either. But we're not done. Look at verse 18 if you've got your Bible open. Verse 18 reads in part with these words, when they, these bad teachers, when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. I'm going to say that again. When they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Would you like to hear that statement in plain old Mark Smith English? Here it goes. They're using high-sounding, educated words that are empty of truth. These bad teachers beguile people using bait of sinful pleasure uh, to just please yourself. Oh, that word allure there. Hey, you guys that are listening today, that word allure, it's a fishing term. It's a fishing term. It was the word a fisherman would use when he's trying to entice that big old bass fish out from the weeds there to draw him out to catch him on his hook. He's going to use a shiny lure trying to allure them, trying to beguile the fish and saying, this is what you need. Come and chomp onto my lure. Now, Peter, Peter was writing to tell believers that not only can we escape the moral and ethical pollutions of our day. We were saved to escape them. Jesus lived an escaped life. I'm going to say that knowing full well that Jesus never sinned. He had nothing to escape from, but Jesus lived an escaped life. He did not get caught up in the moral and ethical pollution of his day, and he's given to us all that we need for life and for godliness so that we can live a life free of moral and ethical pollution. So, Back here to our verses in verses chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. Peter says as long as he is alive, he was going to be prompting believers, mature ones as well, to live holy lives. Are you and I doing this? Are you and I prompting others to live holy lives? Peter did it because he had a relationship with the people he's writing to. Well, with whom do you and I have a relationship? Shouldn't we be doing this? Peter did this reminding word here, work, uh, with great tenacity. In light of our natural tendencies and in light of the bad religious teachers of every era, even mature saints need to be reminded about this. Let me end on a practical note. In the present day that we are living, the standards of holiness are being eroded fast. The standards of what is acceptable morally is eroding fast. And there are today religious teachers who say that being saved by Jesus does not mean your life will change. That teacher is a bad teacher. Run from them. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Track Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.